Since the dawn of time, humans have been creating original characters. From the Greek legends of old to famous creatures of folklore to the modern heroes that we watch and read about today, we basically just love making up little guys. I was super into art and writing when I was younger, like a lot of kids are, and I would spend my days filling notepads and sketchbooks with characters and stories that I made up in my head. Eventually, I began to find online communities based around art and writing, places like Tumblr and DeviantArt and lots of niche old 2000s forums that are probably long dead by now. And there I met tons of other creatives, other people who loved making up stories and worlds and characters just like me. But there was a rule on the internet back then, an unspoken rule but a very important one nonetheless. Your character could be anyone, they could be anything, they could be made for any fandom, but what they could not be was a Mary Sue. But what exactly is a Mary Sue? How did they come about? Why were there so many of them? How cringy were the ones that I made? And why was, or rather still is, there so much hate towards them? Well today let's take a deep dive into the Mary Sue trope and the huge impact that it's had on internet culture. Before we get into things, I just want to give a huge thank you to Casetify for sponsoring this video. If you didn't know already, Casetify make really, really, really cool phone cases that look good and also actually protect your phone. Casetify has hundreds of epic designs to fit any aesthetic. The options are truly endless and new designs are constantly being added. I actually got a new phone for the first time in like forever, so I had to get some Casetify cases for it, so uh, I'll give you a little Casetify case tour. The first one that I got is this dinosaur case. It's super cool. It has a bunch of like dinosaur skeletons on the back and then I got not one but two super cool cat cases. I got one that's like pink and it has this little fairy cat on it and it says I get everything I want which I thought was very whimsical. I also got this super cool one with all these cats like running around on it and for the actual phone color I got this really pretty translucent sort of pearly pink color. It's really nice but if that wasn't enough you can fully customize your very own case to buy cases. You can choose from a huge range of styles and colors and even add your own name or monogram to the back. I took it Back to basics with my custom case this time, it's a lovely teal blue number with Garfield written on the back. You know, timeless and classic. Not only do Case Defy's cases look amazing with tons of customization options, but they have an antimicrobial coating that kills 99% of bacteria and they're really, really tough. Alright guys, it's that time again, the time where I throw my phone full force at my wardrobe to test how strong Case Defy cases really are. Still intact, baby. It's uh, it's totally fine. No scratches. The phone is uh, totally fine. Nothing wrong with it. It's safe. Case to five cases are engineered with a two-layer construction of Chi Tech and a drop test proof for drops of up to 6.6 .6 feet with their impact cases and 9.8 feet for their ultra impact cases. Case to five is all about sustainability. Their impact and ultra impact cases are made of 65% recycled and plant-based material, so you'll be protecting your phone and the environment, which is very cool. So whether you want to zhuzh up your own phone, you know, add a little dazzle to it, or you just want to get a gift for a friend or family member, Case to five is there for you. Head to casetify.com slash Izzy today to save 15% off. Once again, that's casetify.com slash Izzy to save 15% off your order. The link will be in the description. A huge thank you to Casetify for sponsoring this video. I love working with them as always, so definitely go check them out. And uh, now let's get back into our discussion about Mary Sue's. Mary Sue is a term often used in a derogatory manner to describe an original character or OC who is perfect and without flaw. The rules of the universe and the story itself will bend and break around the Mary Sue to make them look as cool and capable as possible and they always have plot armor. Mary Sues are exceptionally powerful, beautiful, and charismatic. Every character in the story instantly falls in love with them or wants to be their friend or is jealous of them because they're just that awesome. It's common in fanfiction for Mary Sues to be related to one of the main characters or villains i.e. a daughter or a long-lost sibling. In original fiction, they might be a prophesized hero, a magical being, royalty, or otherwise descended from someone powerful and important and cool. All of Mary Sue's traits are positive. She's intelligent, beautiful, sweet, and funny, but also frighteningly powerful, strong, and skilled at magic and combat. They tend also to have super OP abilities. They might be immortal, or have rainbow laser vision, or be able to wipe out entire armies with their super epic fighting skills. As you might be able to tell from the name, they tend most often to be female, but male Mary Sue's aka Gary Stews also do exist, but we'll get to that later. It's really common for the creators of these characters to worry that they've made a Mary Sue, so they'll give her quote unquote flaws to balance her personality out. These flaws are usually inconsequential and sometimes even actively endearing, like quirky clumsiness, suffering from her own success or beauty, being adorably shy, or feeling that her totally amazing, stunning, and awesome powers are a curse. 
In short, Mary Sue's are super cool and super epic and super awesome and have no flaws and everybody loves them. Okay, well maybe not everyone since the Mary Sue is one of the most widely hated and criticized tropes in all of fandom, but again, we'll get to that later. For now, let's take a look at the origins of the trope. A Mary Sue history lesson, if you will. Like many aspects of modern fandom culture, the Mary Sue spawned from the Star Trek fandom of the 1970s. More specifically, a Star Trek fanzine called Menagerie. From an article in Smithsonian Magazine, quote, Soon after Paula Smith and Shannon Ferraro launched one of the earliest Star Trek fanzines, they started noticing a pattern to the submissions that they were receiving. Each began the same way. A young woman would board the Starship Enterprise, and because she was just so sweet and good and beautiful and cute, Smith recounts, everybody would just fall all over her. Paula Smith went on to publish a short parody story called A Trekkie's Tale, which follows Lieutenant Mary Sue, a satirical character made to poke fun at the unrealistic self-insert characters that they found in many submissions. Gee golly gosh glorioski, thought Mary Sue as she stepped on the bridge of the Enterprise. Here I am, the youngest lieutenant in the fleet, only 15 and a half years old. Captain Kirk came up to her. Oh lieutenant, I love you madly. Will you come to bed with me? Captain, I am not that kind of girl. You're right and I respect you for it. Here, take over the ship for a minute while I go get some coffee for us. Mr. Spot came onto the bridge. What are you doing in the com- <laughs> What are you doing in the command seat, Lieutenant? <laughs> That's my Spock voice. The captain told me to. Flawlessly logical. I admire your mind. Captain Kirk, Mr. Spock, Dr. McCoy, and Mr. Scott beamed down with Lieutenant Mary Sue to Rigel 37. They were attacked by green androids and thrown into prison. In a moment of weakness, Lieutenant Mary Sue revealed to Mr. Spock that she too was half Vulcan. Recovering quickly, she sprung the lock with her hairpin and they all got away back to the ship. But back on board, Dr. McCoy and Lieutenant Mary Sue found out that the men who had beamed down were seriously stricken by the jumping cold Robbies, Mary Sue less so. While the four officers languished in the sick bay, Lieutenant Mary Sue ran the ship and ran it so well that she received the Nobel Peace Prize, the Vulcan Order of Gallantry, and the Tralfamadorian Order of Good Guyhood. However, the disease finally got her and she fell fatally ill. In the sick bay as she breathed her last, she was surrounded by Captain Kirk, Mr. Spock, Dr. McCoy, and Mr. Scott, all weeping unashamedly at the loss of her beautiful youth and youthful beauty, intelligence, capability, and all-around niceness. Even to this day, her birthday is a national holiday on the Enterprise. Despite just being a generic name for Smith to give the comically perfect parody character the name of the young lieutenant became legendary within the fandom space and many began adopting Mary Sue as a term for unrealistically perfect characters. A few years later, the editors of Menagerie further elaborated on the trope, commenting, quote, Mary Sue stories, the adventures of the youngest and smartest ever person to graduate from the academy and ever get a commission at such a tender age. Usually characterized by unprecedented skill in everything from art to zoology, including karate and arm wrestling. This character can also be found borrowing her way into the good graces slash heart slash mind of one of the big three, Kirk, Spock, and McCoy, if not all three at once. She saves the day by her wit and ability and, if we are lucky, has the good grace to die at the end, being grieved by the entire ship. Paula Smith and Shannon Ferraro continue to reference Mary Sue in their publications and according to fan lore, actually started reaching out to other authors and publications to call their characters Mary Sues. When the authors retaliated, the two would simply comment that, well, they were just trying to help them be better writers and make better characters. And hold on to that thought because this is not the first time that you're going to hear about that happening in this video. The concept of the Mary Sue grew alongside fandom itself. As more and more fandoms cropped up and more and more people were dipping their toes into the world of writing and character creation, Mary Sue's became more prevalent. Mary Sue's have actually evolved a lot throughout the years. The original Sue's from early fandom started out fairly basic, but they became more and more elaborate as time went on and authors and artists tried to one-up each other. After all, the very premise of the Mary Sue is that she's the most special, unique, and powerful character in the universe, and as the Mary Sue market became more saturated, the characters had to become increasingly ridiculous. But Mary Sue's aren't a one-size-fits-all thing. They come in many different forms, so let's go over a bullet point list of all of the main Mary Sue subspecies. I made a tweet asking for people to share their real life Mary Sue OCs that they made as a kid so thankfully we'll have a lot of real life examples to go off. The credit to each author slash artist will be included with each. Without further ado, let's start with... So when I say fantasy, you might be thinking like high fantasy, like elves and sword fights and knights and dragons, etc. And while Mary Sue's absolutely do exist in those types of stories, we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about the delightfully nonsensical 2010's tween fantasy genre. A lot of young authors online will make up their own fantasy worlds for comics or role plays or whatever, and they'll just throw every single concept or story element that they think is cool into it. This is how you get half angel, half demon cat hybrids, runaway lab experiments with ice powder 
powers and pet unicorns and high school teens who can shapeshift into dragons and use a scythe as a weapon because everyone knows that the coolest weapon your character can use is a scythe. And I know that for a fact because when I was 13 I had this roleplay character that was like a blue furry cat woman who could fly and was the most acrobatic fighter on earth and also had a scythe for some reason. Oh wait, actually I do know the reason, it's because it's cool as hell. A perfect example of one of these extremely cool but nonsensical fantasy Mary Sue's is this character who was quote, a teenage girl who could turn into a purple wolf using a wolf fan necklace inspired by Tokyo Mew Mew. Also the most popular girl in school with a dark secret. Some other examples include Kira, an angel neko demon who was also royalty, Mystery, a half angel half demon who was an outcast for having different coloured ears, and Mayuki, a post-nuclear world mutant with cat DNA who could change her left arm into any shape disregarding the laws of physics. I love fantasy Sus a lot because the authors just say, you know what, I think cats and wolves and angels and elemental powers and dragon taming and shapeshifting and crystals and emo bangs and MS paints default colours are all epic and I want them all in my story and I want them all on this one character. Honestly, you gotta respect it. Let's move on to... Snarky, rude, and sarcastic, Edgy Mary Sues will actively go out of their way to be assholes, yet somehow still have the entire cast fawning over them in adoration. Edgy Sues are sarcastic, brooding, mysterious, hot-headed, and very, very emo, and are usually treated like God's gift to mankind, even if in reality they'd be extremely unlikable people. A lot of people shared with me that they used to write their characters this way, and I related so much. When I was a kid, all of my characters used to be these, like, snappy comeback, like, quirky, sarcastic, rude, not like other girls girls. I thought it was really cool. A pro tip, it wasn't. <laughs> Edgy Sus are usually pretty easy to spot. Dark brown or black bangs covering one eye is a staple, black, red or purple colour schemes are common, and like fantasy Sus, Edgy Sus are often wolf, demon or dragon hybrids with devastating powers. Because they're edgy and hashtag deep, these powers are often considered a curse and may tie into their dark, sad backstory. These characters almost never have parents because as every young author knows, the single most easy way to give a character the illusion of depth is to give them a sad I accidentally killed my parents as a baby because I was so powerful backstory. Plus as a bonus there were no stinky parents to get in the way of your cool teen character going on magical adventures by themselves for months or years at a time. Two birds one stone. Or should I say two black and magenta phoenixes that have shadow powers, one amethyst that makes me immortal. Some examples of edgy Mary Sue's include this character who was quote, a self insert creepypasta from like 2012. She was the daughter of the grim reaper and was the most powerful reaper of all time. She also had literally every kind of superpower all at the age of 12, she was also 6 feet tall. Queen Luna, half wolf, half dragon demon queen, primarily black and purple wolf, started out as a Five Nights at Freddy's OC, could do anything with magic if I recall correctly. The most Mary Sue to have ever Mary Sued. Her name was Angelica, she's a fallen angel that's super cool and badass, always sarcastic and mean yet so kind with the people she cares about. Literally had any power that the plot called for, of course, she's iconic to be honest. Animal Jam OC who was a black wolf dragon, she was the leader of Spirit Clan and super mysterious, lived in the lost temple of Zeos and had allegiances with the phantoms. Now let's take a look at… Whether it's Steven Universe, Pokemon, Warrior Cats, Sonic, Undertale, Five Nights at Freddy's, or a uh, Seinfeld, Mary Sue's are ubiquitous within online fandoms. After all, the original Mary Sue herself was a Star Trek fan character. Fan Sue's are usually pretty diverse and differ depending on the character and the fandom, but if I had to give a list of common fan Sue traits, I would say A. Mary Sue's usually serve as self inserts that allow authors to ship themselves with the canon characters, so they'll often be dating one or more of the main characters. The characters that aren't in love with them will either be jealous of how awesome they are or will spend the entire story complimenting them and hyping up their epic skills. B. They'll be more powerful than all of the main cast combined and will shock everyone with their strength and skill. C. They'll break the rules and status quo of their given universe. For example, a Harry Potter or C will be part of a secret super powerful house called Blood Claw and they'll have a pet unicorn or if they're a warrior cat so C they'll be part of a secret clan of loners with shadow powers called Death Clan. It's rare to see a Mary Sue have a regular job or be part of any of the pre-existing canon factions of their story. Instead, the author will make up a super cool and edgy faction 
created specifically for them to accentuate how special and gifted they are. D, they'll always stand out. If everyone else in the story has a plain beige school uniform, theirs will be neon blue and black. If everyone else gets a simple sword, they'll be given a hot pink katana with flames on it. If everyone else can shapeshift into a different type of bird, they'll be able to turn into a dragon. Like I said, your mileage for these really varies depending on the fandom and the character, but most fansus have at least one or two of these. Here are some great examples of those types of characters. Had a warrior cat who had black fur that glowed purple when the light hit it and green eyes. She mastered the killing blow at the age of three moons, was made a warrior about four moons before her siblings, and was exiled from Shadow Clan for being too dangerous. A thousand cringe memories just flashed before my eyes. This was my X-Men Evolution fan character, Ebony D I mean Nightshade. If I recall correctly, she was venomous and could eat any poison, no problem. Super edgy shit. This is Thunderstar, my first warrior cat's OC. She had two special powers, the power to turn into a lion and the power to heal wounds and inflict damage upon the attacker. Firestar and Sandstorm were her parents and she becomes leader because of course she does. Vitalini, the wolf slash hedgehog slash bat hybrid who was Shadow's long lost sister, a rock star and Knuckles' Sundere girlfriend. Next up we have... Clone Sues, also known as Copycat Sues, are a subgenre of fan character Mary Sues. They're basically carbon copies of pre-existing fictional characters with a few details changed, often to make them cooler, slash more powerful, slash more like the author. There are two types of Clone Sues, overpowered descendants and quote unquote totally unrelated characters. For an example of an overpowered descendant, you might have Daniela Targaryen, daughter of Daenerys Targaryen. She looks just like her mom except her hair is blue and 10 feet long and she has pink eyes and dragon wings and she has 12 dragons instead of just three. As another example, Twitter user at LoveMyTarantula wrote, quote, When I was in elementary school, I had a Sonic OC named Frieza the Hedgehog who was Sonic's cousin and he had stupidly OP ice powers and he was also the leader of a rock band. And also he was in a relationship with Amy Rose. User at Sour Cherry Scones wrote, Meet Shadow Pelt, the angsty scourge tiger star warrior OC ripoff. Born as a runt, he was bullied, he wanted to be leader, brother became deputy first, he killed brother, he became deputy. He tries to overthrow a leader. He is kicked out and takes over Shadow Clan. This OC definitely also fits the edgy Sue label as well. You get the point. Basically, someone sees a character they think is cool, yoinks their personality and or appearance, gives them a new name, and makes them a daughter slash brother slash long lost second cousin in law to explain the similarities. For an example of a totally unrelated character, wink wink nudge nudge, you might have this character that I made as a kid. I can't remember her name, but what I do remember is that she was a survivalist hashtag girl boss teenager that lived in a dystopian world where every teen was magically transported into a deadly arena to complete trials and face off against other teens. And of course she was the most skilled archer in the entire world and also had yellow eyes. If you'd have asked me at the time, Izzy, did you just steal the character of Katniss Everdeen but give her yellow eyes? I would have sworn up and down that this was an 100% original character and story. Do not steal. But I would have been lying, of course. This was just a teen dystopia Mary Sue Katniss Everdeen clone and a perfect example of the totally unrelated character trope. Let's move on to... It's a well-known fact that I'll use literally any excuse to talk about My Little Pony on this channel, so yeah, you know, you should have seen this coming. My Little Sues are most often alicorns, the rarest type of pony in the show having both wings and a horn. They're usually princesses or royalty of some kind, sometimes directly related to Celestia, Luna, Cadence, or Twilight, and often having some super OP magic or ability. While sickly sweet pastel cupcake rainbow alicorn goddesses were pretty common, I think edgy black and red radioactive neon demons were even more common, the MLP fandom loved their edgy Mary Sues. The most infamous example of this is Princess Neon Boom, an OC owned by the DeviantArt user Neko Mello. Neon Boom is this wonderfully garish black rainbow neon celestia recolor with knee-high converse and a rainbow horn and black cheetah print everywhere and I love her so much. Back in the day though, Neon Boom was one of the most infamous OCs within the fandom, frequently shared around various sites for bronies to make fun of and make cruel comments about. Look at any My Little Pony OC blog or how-to and there's a decent chance Neon Boom will be there as an example of what not to do, though despite this many more black and white neon rainbow alicorns would come after her. Seriously, these black neon rainbow OCs were absolutely everywhere back in the day. If you were in the fandom back then, you know exactly what I'm talking about. As a side note for all you people in the comments, I do not want to see any Neon Boom slander here. This character is part of brony history and must be protected at all costs. Being a young brony slash pegasister in the fandom at a young age, I made my fair share of Mary Sue's. 
I had this one OC who was an alicorn fox hybrid with 12 tails and another who I basically invented because I was jealous of Twilight Sparkle becoming an alicorn. I made this character called Swirl Star who was also a purple alicorn and was basically just a better cooler version of Twilight and I would always draw the main characters telling her how cool she was and Twilight would be like off in the corner seething about it. And for those asking, no I don't particularly want to drill down into the psychological implications of child me being jealous of a literal animated horse so you know, let's just not go there. I mean, I don't like to brag, but I consider myself somewhat of an authority on the whole topic given that at the ripe old age of 13 I wrote a book on Wattpad about how to make a good My Little Pony OC and I had a lot to say about Mary Sue's. A quote, If you're wanting to use your OC to roleplay, then you'll need to stay within the guidelines of the fandom. My Little Pony personality rules number one, Mary Sueism. Avoid this at all costs because any beauty crystal moon princess alicorn element of amazing will be immediately dismissed as a joke OC. Okay, I have a huge rant to get out about this. Don't make your pony an alicorn because you can't decide on a race or because you want them to be cool. In the world of My Little Pony Friendship is Magic, alicorns are always royal or have some significance. Alicorns are a big deal so if a pony was to be born one they would be famous. There are no civilian alicorns, okay? Your alicorn can't go under the radar in any town, full stop. And it's so needless, there are so many DJ alicorns. I'm not even kidding, go onto Google Images and look up MLP DJ OC and I swear you will find more than one. You may have noticed that I did a complete 180 from making Mary Sue's on the rig to hating them with a burning passion and condescending to anyone who would listen about how trash they were and hold on to that thought, we'll come back to it later. You may have also noticed that was extremely cringe. And yes, yes it was. Those little excerpts I just read up there are but a taste of how annoying I was at that age. Anyway, let's take a look at a couple of other examples of My Little Pony Mary Sue's. I took this design and made it my own character. Her name was Diamond Rose, an alicorn who was Celestia's sister and was pretty much Fluttershy but exaggerate her personality times 10. She was part of the main six and acted like a baby because I thought it was cute. This is Midnight Shadow, he's half demon and the husband and baby daddy of Princess Luna from MLP. He has a tragic past, has supernatural abilities and has many, many transformations. I never knew how to draw him so I just did him in the official MLP pony maker for Facebook. Her name was Goddess Omega Daybreak Dawn and was best friends with Princess Twilight and married to Kai from Ninjago. This character is one of my favorites that I've seen like ever. I also love the little speech bubble that just says, we are crystallized, yay! <laughs> White unicorn MLP OC with black and red spiky hair and red eyes who didn't want friends because she can turn into a dragon and later became friends with the main six. The worst thing is that I can identify exactly where that spiky hair came from. It came from General Zoe's pony creator, the bane of every 2010's bronies existence. I made so many terrible characters in that thing. Anyway, enough ranting about ponies, let's move on to something a bit more palatable. Furries. As I'm sure you know by this point, furries are very much a thing online, and since the dawn of the internet, the anthropomorphic animal community has been steadily growing in number. With so many internet denizens discovering and joining the furry community over the years, which is basically built on the idea of original characters and roleplay, there were bound to be a few Mary Sues. They even got their own name within the furry fandom, Sparkle Dogs. Sparkle Dogs are a furry subtype of Mary Sue, best known for their bright neon fur colors, unnatural clashing patterns, and magical slash mythical features like wings, spikes, Bikes, unicorn horns, magical tails, etc. Sparkle dogs are actually pretty heavily linked to 2000 and 2010 emo and scene culture. Back then, it was super common to see emo teens making edgy sparkle dog OCs with scene hair and raccoon tails or sideswept bangs, often accompanied by various hot topic accessories. Most types of Mary Sue's we've covered have over the top or fantastical designs, but sparkle dogs are by far the most visually intense form of Sue, characterized by their eye bleeding RGB colors, clashing nonsensical patterns and textures, and tons of tiny intricate accessories. Basically, if you handed a sparkle dog to an animator, they'd tell you to jump off a cliff. Pop culture Mary Sue's are interesting, not because they're particularly over the top or ostentatious, in fact compared to a lot of other Mary Sue types we've covered they're pretty tame, but they're interesting because they bring Mary Sue discourse into the public light. See for a time Mary Sue's were a fairly terminally online concept. Most people who knew the ins and outs of the trope and actively engaged with it grew up on old writing forums or spent most of their time online and in fandom spaces. But then maybe one day some character comes along from a big movie or franchise and a few people online 
online accuse them of being Mary Sue's and then maybe a few publications catch wind of that and then suddenly every man and his dog on the internet knows what a Mary Sue is. Two really big cases of pop culture Sue's blowing up so much that they usher Mary Sue discourse into the public light are Bella Swan from Stephanie Meyer's Twilight series and Rey Skywalker from Star Wars. Back in 2008 to 2012, Twilight was pop culture. From Team Edward vs Team Jacob debates to which Twilight vampire are you quizzes to vampire merch lining the walls of every hot topic in sight to Twilight themed water bottles, it truly was the moment. And while it was adored by hundreds and thousands of tweens across the globe, it was hated just as passionately by its many, many detractors. Sparkly vampire memes, jokes about the actors and their wooden performances, and most prevalent of all, complaints that Bella Swan was a Mary Sue. In both the books and the movies, Bella immediately attracts a large group of adoring friends. Despite her lack of charisma, she has the natural ability to repel the mental powers of vampires, and throughout the course of the story she manages to net herself a powerful, sexy, immortal vampire boyfriend who then turns her into a powerful, immortal vampire and they have a powerful, immortal vampire daughter. She's a classic example of a not like other girls, Mary Sue. She's openly uninterested in fashion or pop culture or her female friends, and she's described as unconventionally attractive despite the fact that she spends most of the series swanning around, pun intended, looking hot and being cool. Rey, Star Wars on the other hand, is a far more modern example of a character that's been dubbed a Mary Sue by the masses. After the third Star Wars trilogy was released featuring Daisy Ridley as the character Rey Skywalker, there were tons of Mary Sue accusations leveled at the character. Rant posts began to flood Twitter Twitter and Reddit, those YouTubers who release like 10 videos a day complaining about every new movie release were milking the shit out of it, and memes were posted en masse making fun of Rey and her Mary Sueism. According to a blog post by author Christopher John Lindsay, Rey fit the trope because, among other things, she was an extremely skilled fighter despite her inexperience, she had special powers that allowed her to overcome even the toughest of enemies, and she exhibited knowledge and prowess in many skills. He also wrote, quote, Rey is an unrealistic character because she achieves success too easily. In the real world, women must work just as hard as men to be successful. Women can achieve the same or even greater things as men, but not when they have less experience. I like the or even greater in brackets. Women achieving the same things as men, I can believe, but greater? <laughs> Save it for the brackets, pal. There have been countless articles arguing back and forth over whether Rey's $70 billion franchise Skywalker is a Mary Sue or not. Some claim that she's the suest of the Sues and an example of a poorly written character, while others vehemently defend her, staunchly opposed to the idea that she fits the trope at all. And naturally, all of this media coverage brought the question into the public light, so much so that it transformed from Star Wars discourse into just Mary Sue discourse. As a final example, let's take a look at Ebony Darkness Dementia Raven Way from the infamous Harry Potter a fan fiction My Immortal. Hi, my name is Ebony Darkness Dementia Ravenway and I have long ebony black hair, that's how I got my name, with purple streaks and red tips that reaches my mid back and icy blue eyes like limpid tears and a lot of people tell me I look like Amy Lee. Author's note, if you don't know who she is, get the hell out of here. I'm not related to Gerard Way but I wish I was because he's a major fucking hottie. I'm a vampire but my teeth are straight and white, I have pale white skin, I'm also a witch and I go to a magic school called Hogwarts in England where I'm in the seventh year. I'm 17. I'm a goth, in case you couldn't tell, and I wear mostly black. I love Hot Topic and buy all my clothes from there. The iconic 2006 fanfic went viral for being so bad it was good, and the widespread mockery made Ebony Darkness Dementia Raven Way, who, as a side note, also dated Draco and quote unquote Vampire Potter into a bona fide pop culture Mary Sue. To give you an idea of just how popular My Immortal was, even beyond the thousands of blog posts and videos and articles about it, I have a real life anecdote. When I was younger, my uncle came from overseas to visit us, and he had literally printed out the entire book of my immortal for my dad and my aunt to read because quote you won't believe how bad this is. Neither he or my dad were particularly online people and I doubt they knew much about fan fiction let alone what a Mary Sue was but here they were exposed to it. That's how big my immortal was, it was turning innocent dads and uncles into Harry Potter Mary Sue fanfic consumers. The point is despite how ridiculous it may seem, my immortal and ebony darkness dementia raven way were pretty instrumental in introducing the general public to the concept of the Mary Sue. And this leads us nicely into the next section of this video because while now it's easy for us to look back with nostalgia and even fondness for these Mary Sues, you can't fully understand the trope without looking at the tremendous backlash that it received back in the day and what I like to call the anti-Mary Sue movement. Okay, so you know how early we were talking about that Star Trek fanzine and the Mary Sue fic and how the authors started actually reaching out to people to accuse their characters of being Mary Sues? And you know how I said that was a thing we were going to come back to? 
Uh, well, we're coming back to it. Much like the original Star Trek fanzine, editors, writers, and artists online began to see patterns in the kind of characters that people were making, especially within fandom spaces. They were super hot and had all the other characters falling all over them. They were smart and strong and they were able to defeat armies and destroy planets and bring down governments with an elegant flick of the wrist, or r rather flick of the scythe. And this pissed a lot of people off. These characters flew in the face of every conventional rule of character creation. They were unfairly overpowered, they were clearly just over and indulgent shippy self-inserts and it could not stand. The war on Mary Sue's had begun. One of the most popular ways for writers and artists to express their anti-Mary Sue views was by creating intentionally ridiculous and satirical parody Sue's in the same vein as Lieutenant Mary Sue from the original Trekkie Tale fanfic. They were always these neon rainbow messes with a hundred wings and layers of clashing accessories and given every positive personality trait, skill, and power in the entire world. Because a lot of Mary Sue's were made by kids and were drawn in MS Paint or made using DeviantArt bases, these parody Sue's would often be drawn poorly on purpose and have tons of bad grammar. Similarly, as a form of anti-Mary Sue protest, people would make these comparison memes which were almost exactly like those Tumblr not like other girl pictures except it was basically just not like other OCs. They'd do a side-by-side -side comparison of a quote-unquote normal character which was often their own character next to an overblown parody Mary Sue meant to prove how ridiculous Mary Sue's were and how great their character was. These pictures also served as guides on the what to do and what not to do's of character creation and design and were even shared around as tutorials. But it didn't stop at parodies. Once people learned what Mary Sue's were, they saw them everywhere and they made it their sovereign duty to stamp them all out of existence. And if you were there back in the trenches of the 2010s, you know just how bad it got. Kids would post their OCs on DeviantArt and wake up to comments flooded with insults and accusations that their character was a Mary Sue. If someone posted a Mary Sue character on a forum or in a roleplay group, they were liable to be banned or even removed from the group entirely. It got to the point where people made Tumblr blogs and Wattpad books dedicated to making fun of Mary Sue characters that they found online, just finding random OCs on Google Images and putting them on blast for their large audiences to laugh and jeer at. In most cases, the artists behind these OCs wouldn't find out that hundreds of people had been making fun of them until someone reached out to them and actually told them. Some Mary Sue cringe blogs began to brand themselves in a more constructive way, claiming that their goal was to help people make better OCs. They allowed people to submit their own characters for review, as showcased by blogs like the Mary Sue Rehab Center and the Mary Sue Review, as well as Wattpad books like Mary Sue slash OC Reviews, Mary Sue Test, How Not to Mary Sue, and more, with descriptions like, Wattpad is on the brink of war. Slowly but surely an army is forming, one based on ignorance, pride, and rainbows. <laughs> an army of Mary Sues. Join our efforts to combat the ever-growing ranks of the Mary Sues by submitting your OC for review. If we work together, we can win this war, one Mary Sue conversion at a time. Prepare to have your dream crushed and hearts broken. By the way, I know it seems kind of random that a lot of this went down on Wattpad of all places. You know, most people think of Wattpad as where kids post their One Direction fanfics, but as someone who used to use the site a lot, it had a pretty bustling art community. These kinds of how-to books were actually super common. Man, that site is crazy. Wattpad really needs its own video sometime. All of these user-run criticism blogs were all well and good, but what if you didn't have time to wait for a response? You needed to know whether your OC Frost Dragon Thistle Shadow Knight was a Mary Sue right now, damn it. Well, to solve this issue, several quizzes and tests were created which allowed writers to answer a list of questions about their character and get an instant result. Again, if you're like me and were in the trenches of this Mary Sue war in the 2010s, you'll get flashbacks when I mention the website Springhole.net. Springhole.net had arguably the most comprehensive and most popular Mary Sue test online, the Universal Mary Sue Litmus Test. The test asked questions such as, is your character's name taken deliberately from a character or another fandom that you like? Is your character's name very unusual for your character's place in situation, e.g. a medieval English princess named Sakura or Raven? Is anyone, including you, jealous of your character's good looks? Does your character have a natural eye coloration not normally found in Zer race or species? Note, Alexandria's genesis is not real. Hey. How many animals does your character keep? Is said animal a wolf, bird of prey, big cat, or mythical creature? Does your character have the ability to shapeshift? Does your character alone use a weapon that is magical or has some sort of other unique properties or is unusually ornate? Did you feel that this test insulted or attacked you or your character so far? According to the owner of Springhole.net, this test is essentially what put the website on the map and it was so widely used that it became a staple on writing and character creation blogs all 
all across the web. Often one of the first tips that authors would give was to test your characters using the universal Mary Sue litmus test because there was no sin worse than having your character be one. This hypervigilant anti-Mary Sue culture is what I personally believe fit into a lot of the cringe culture of the late 2010s, the kind of culture that spawned hundreds of YouTube channels dedicated to taking kids art and animations and putting them into cringe compilations. I mentioned earlier how I went from making Mary Sue's regularly to literally writing a book about how much I hated them and I'm not the only one who went through this sort of pipeline. Not only were creatives being bombarded with anti-Mary Sue hate videos and how-to guides and a hundred plus question litmus tests but there were throngs of fellow creatives eagerly waiting to police any character that they came across. The internet had made it clear that Mary Sue's were dumb and terrible and so were the people that made them and fearful that one day we'd see our own characters on a terrible OC Tumblr blog, we became deathly afraid of making them. So we unrainbowed our characters, we took away all of their cool abilities and we gave them regular names and backstories. But in our desperate efforts to not make Mary Sue's, we ended up creating another form of Sue, a Sue the likes we'd never seen before. The Anti-Sue. Anti-Sues are typically made by people who are so afraid of accidentally making their character a Mary Sue that they instead make a bland and pointless plank of wood devoid of any positive traits at all. They're typically described as pathetic, ugly losers who can't do anything right and have zero positive traits, though in typical Mary Sue fashion they're usually drawn looking like supermodels anyway. The authors get scared that giving them even one positive trait might suddenly turn them into a Sue, so they're either given no personality at all or an actively offensive, evil, and irredeemable one. The logic is that by giving them every possible horrible trait it will ensure that they can never become a Sue, but since they're basically just reverse Mary Sues, they're still considered to be on the Sue spectrum. A lot of characters back in the day went from neon fox kitsune princesses to plain boring planks of wood with no personality. Over time, as people caught wind of the anti-Sue trope, they began to call that out as well. It became a balancing act, you couldn't make your character too brightly coloured or skilled at anything, but you also had to make them just interesting enough so they weren't considered a boring try-hard anti-Sue. Unfortunately, for many artists and writers online, it really sucked the fun out of creating characters and worlds. At that point it was just unnecessarily stressful and a lot of young creatives kind of just started drifting away from art and writing because of it, which really sucks. But the big question really is, why did this all happen? Why did Mary Sue's rise to prominence and why were they met with such hatred and vitriol? It's a complex and nuanced topic, so let's discuss. The simple answer to the question, why do Mary Sue's exist, is basically, well, just because they're fun. They're usually, but not exclusively, made by kids and are often self-inserts, allowing the author to ship themselves with the characters or imagine they're the super cool hero that all of their favourite characters love. And while yes, they can be poorly written and goofy and, dare I say it, a bit cringe, which I can say with confidence because my childhood Mary Sue's were all three of those things, is there really anything wrong with that? Again, speaking from experience, a lot of Mary Sue's were created by kids from a place of frustration. You're growing up and realising that the world isn't fair, it can be scary, a lot of things are out of your control, and maybe imagining yourself as Lieutenant Mary Sue, the coolest and most perfect character to ever have lived, is empowering. Your tweens and early teen years are also just a really hard time in general. School sucks, it can be hard to fit in and make friends, and it's easy to feel isolated and weird. Writing a character who's also an isolated, friendless teenager but can secretly turn into a purple dragon wolf with angel wings and crystal powers is, again, empowering and can help you cope and make sense of things IRL. But on the other hand, a lot of Mary Sue's don't exist for any deeper reason, they just exist because the author thought they were cool and they wanted to have fun making something and, well, that's fine too. Mary Sue's are cool and fun, they're funny and bright and over the top, they're basically just big amalgamations of everything the author or artist thinks is cool and there's something really great about that. Art doesn't always have to be well thought out and intricately crafted and perfectly plotted and planned, art doesn't even have to be good. Art is just art and sometimes it's fun when art is just someone having fun and making something silly and weird and self-indulgent. And I don't even really blame the people who are running these Mary Sue blogs or making posts and guides about it or making videos because, well, a lot of them were kids and they were just following the popular trends at the time. It's the same reason that I went from making Mary Sues to being super afraid of making them to actively hating them because I saw a lot of cool creators and artists that I like doing the same thing and, well, I just hopped on the bandwagon. We were all so caught up in the silly arbitrary rules and the idea of quote-unquote good versus bad characters that we didn't think 
well, even if the character is bad, what's wrong with that? Sometimes when someone writes a story or creates a piece of art or makes a character, the goal isn't for it to be good. The goal is to just have fun and enjoy the process and create something special to them. And something that's terribly written and shoddily drawn and totally nonsensical that the author enjoyed making still holds value and is an important piece of art, in my opinion. I know it's not an opinion that everyone holds and that's fine, but I think there's a catharsis to embracing cringe and accepting that sometimes making saturated MS Paint My Little Pony or Sonic OCs with every power in the universe is fun. I think more people should make self-indulgent overpowered Mary Sue OCs. I hope all the Marvel characters are replaced with black neon rainbow DJ alicorns and then you'll all be sorry. But me ranting about how much I love Mary Sue's aside, it's also worth discussing the actual discourse that has surrounded the term Mary Sue in recent years. There's this thing that happens on the internet sometimes where a bunch of people will discover a hot new term and start using it really liberally without understanding the history or the context behind it, to the point where it goes from a word that once had meaning to a pointless internet buzzword and yeah, that's pretty much what happened with the term Mary Sue. After the popularization of the term and all of the public discourse that followed, characters no longer had to be an RGB Neko wolf demon goddess with eight wings and a foxtail who has every elemental power in the world. Now it was just powerful characters, or just popular characters, or dare I say it, just female characters. Because it's important to note that while male Mary Sues, aka Gary Stews, do exist, the trope was built off of female characters and has always been heavily associated with women in fandom. The once highly specific definition of Mary Sue had begun to widen and become more vague to the point where critics could use the term for pretty much any character they didn't like, especially if they were female. And this isn't just like a modern internet problem, this problem has existed since the very inception of the trope itself. All the way back at the start of this video, we discussed a Star Trek fanzine and the authors who popularized the term Mary Sue, and what a lot of authors in the fandom soon came to find out was that in a post-Mary Sue world, every female character they made was accused of fitting into the trope. During a 1987 Enterprising Women panel at Clippicon, one author was quoted as saying, Every time I've tried to put a woman in any story I've ever written, everyone immediately says, this is a Mary Sue. The automatic reaction that you're going to get is, that's a Mary Sue. Despite the authors of the original parody fic making statements clarifying that their intentions weren't to put down inspiring stories about female characters, it was too late, and to this day the trope has been used to do just that. In a 2019 Waroni article, writer and filmmaker Julia Farager writes, quote, Mary Sue isn't a cleverly developed critical term. It's an excuse for sexism and used by whiny fanboys who aren't happy that women have power and agency. Characters like Harry Potter, Clark Kent, and James Bond haven't faced tirades from fans for being Mary Sues, even though they are highly powered characters who always save the day and lack obvious flaws. On the other side, you have those who wholeheartedly disagree with the idea of the Mary Sue as a sexist trope and feel that it's hashtag woke culture gone mad. Please, guys, get out of the feminist tupper and see that people criticize Gary Stews everywhere. Have you heard about Superman or Carito or Batman or Aragon? Nice to see you yet again having those double standards because sure, no one hates male characters. And it's true of course that there have been plenty of male characters who have been criticized as being too cool, too perfect, and too overpowered. But critics have argued that these characters are more likely to be celebrated for these qualities and are less likely to be criticized using the Mary Sue label. They argue that the term Mary Sue is at best an unhelpful and vague criticism and at worst wielded to dismiss and denigrate female characters for just taking up space in media. Whether you believe that's a valid criticism or just feminist tupper is really up to you, I'm not here to change hearts and minds, but it's still an interesting conversation and pretty important to the history and legacy of the trope. In the wake of these discussions about the impact and potential harm of the Mary Sue trope, many people have changed their viewpoints and even apologized for their participation in early Mary Sue discourse. As we covered before, the original authors of Menagerie stated that they didn't want people to use the Mary Sue trope so liberally to insult female characters in fandom spaces. The original author of the Mary Sue litmus test, an iconic staple of online character creation and one of if not the most popular and well-known websites about the trope, has since disavowed both the test and the term Mary Sue, quote, I am no longer supporting this test nor do I support using the term Mary Sue to describe any character for any reason. The test is simply here for archival purposes and to provide this message to anyone who follows a link to this page. Instead of using it, please go to does my character work okay how to tell for yourself. 
if you really, really, really want to use this test for some reason, please at least stop using the term Mary Sue. There are far better ways to talk about characters who just don't work for one reason or another than using a term that's more often than not just used to tear down female characters simply for having a prominent active role in a story. Similarly, many anti-Mary Sue blogs on Tumblr, Wattpad, and various forums have since apologized for their actions. The author of a popular Tumblr blog called Mary Sue Facepalm recently updated their blog for the first time in several years with a post titled, This Blog Should Have Never Been Made. I would like to say from the bottom of my heart that I am sorry to everyone who I demean, talked down to, and knowingly hurt. Running this blog is one of my deepest regrets. I'm ashamed that this is part of my past. Running this blog is one of my deepest regrets. I'm ashamed that this is part of my past. It's really great to see a lot of these old anti-Mary Sue bloggers changing their minds and growing over time. It shows a lot of maturity and I really respect them for it. Again, while it doesn't negate the harm done, it is still worth keeping in mind that a lot of these bloggers were also just kids at the time. So this leads us to our final question. Are Mary Sue still a thing? And is it even okay to use the term Mary Sue anymore? Well, the answer really depends on your personal preferences and beliefs on the topic. Some use the word as a catch-all term for overpowered or badly written characters or even just characters they don't like, while others are opposed to the term and encourage people to remove it from their vocabulary altogether. And then there are others, like me, who fall somewhere in the middle. The term has been misused a lot over the years and I don't think it's a particularly helpful piece of criticism. People should be free to criticize the media they consume, whether it be the stories or the worlds or the characters, and I think it's important that people be allowed to do that. Not everyone likes their media or their franchises or their stories to have Mary Sue characters and they should be able to express that. But these articles that are just like, oh, insert character here is a huge Mary Sue, here's why, just end up generating tons of arguments and infighting between fans and none of it actually drills down into the character's flaws or how they could be better written. So yeah, I think that authors and journalists and critics deciding to remove Mary Sue from their handy list of buzzwords isn't the worst thing ever. But on the other hand, I kind of love Mary Sue's. I look back at all of mine with a lot of fondness, and even though I can appreciate now how goofy they are, that's kind of why I love them. Like I said earlier, I don't think people should be ashamed of making them, and I don't think Mary Sue should be a bad word or an insult. Rainbow laser-eyed super god sparkle dogs are fun, cool teenage girls who date sparkly Robert Pattons and vampires are fun, sonic OCs with godly powers are fun. As I've grown up, and honestly especially as I've been doing this channel, I've found more and more that one of the most wonderful things you can do is just embrace your cringe. That's why I love these types of characters, they're just everything the author likes and thinks is cool and they exist in spite of all the unwritten internet rules about what's cringe and what's not. Here's a cool little secret I've learned, there aren't any rules. So grab your MS Paint, grab your DeviantArt base, grab every single colour visible to the human eye plus some that probably don't even exist yet. Take everything that makes you happy and everything you think looks cool and every weird niche interest you have and make that Mary Sue. I promise that society and the concept of art as we know it isn't going to collapse if you do. Definitely let me know about your characters in the comments, honestly one of my favourite things is hearing about people's old Mary Sue characters and like all of the crazy powers and abilities and stuff that they had. It's honestly so much fun to me looking back at these kind of things. I had a blast like going over all my old characters and looking at other people's characters for this video so please if you had any Mary Sue characters please share them below. Um, the more detail the better, I want to see all those stunning, overpowered, wonderful, badass characters. Also, I'm really curious to hear from people who are sort of in the same, like, internet communities and spaces as I was as a kid. Um, if you, you know, use the Mary Sue litmus test, if you heard any advice about Mary Sue's, or even, you know, wrote your own advice. Um, yeah, just generally the whole culture around them back at that time is super interesting to me, and I'm really curious to hear, um, anyone's, you know, first-hand experience of that time. Thank you guys so much for watching this video, I really appreciate it. Um, this video is actually quite hard to make, um, I struggle with the script because I wanted to do it justice because Mary Sue's are a topic that I'm very passionate about, I wanted to make sure that I got it completely right um, and got out everything I wanted to say so um, yeah I'm really glad that it's done and I'm so glad that it's out and I really hope that you like it. Um, if there are any things that I like forgot, if there are any takes or perspectives that I didn't include that you want to share definitely let me know. Um, just the whole culture around that time is super interesting to me um, and I, yeah I really want to hear everyone's perspectives and um, everything like that. Again thank you so much for watching, I really appreciate it, um, thank you guys for just supporting the channel and watching what I make and leaving comments and just everything. Um, I appreciate you guys so much and yeah I really hope you enjoyed this video and I hope to see you in the next one. Bye! 
A huge thank you to my girl food overlords over on Patreon. Sheriff Whiskey, Xavier Rajo, SHSL Sunsun, Grip Gunderson, Simon, Katrina Likes 5e Stuff, Dozo Blint, Red Meff, The Phobia Librarian, Matt LRJ, Ren Pendragon, Michelle Olsen, Astrium Vortex, Electro Kitten, Joe Bradshaw, Jordan Nielsen, John Leach, Jorge K. Cruz, Helm Hamburger Hand, Kimono My Gyro, Fitzy, Pom, Dana Home Gardener, Arcantilus, Jesse Chisholm, Charlie B, Brianna Robinson, Blue Mayfell, Din Meadow, and Doug. Thank you guys so much for supporting me, it means the world to me. If you want to join these guys over on Patreon, head to the link in the description, and yeah, I appreciate you guys, thank you as always, and I really hope to see you in the next one. Bye!